Okay, so today we have three excellent companies, uh, JEPS Techno from France, Orbital Marine from uh, Scotland, and C-Track, which is, happens to be one of our member companies. Uh, as, as Jason said, these are three very different kind of companies from kind of municipal level electricity down to powering instruments, so power, powering the blue economy. So I think it's a great example of the breadth of this industry and great companies that will be presenting. We always start with those that are the, that person or the, the, the company that's furthest away and work our way back toward the United States. So uh, we'd like to hand it over to uh, to uh, Jeff's, uh, Jeff's uh, Techno at this point. Thank you, Michael. So I'll be sharing my screen. Good morning, Audrey. Good morning, everyone. I'm Audrey Jordan, the Sales Director of JEPS Techno, the pioneer of hybridization of renewable energies at sea. I'm very honored to be part of this Blue Tech event, thanks to the organizers and to the French cluster Paul Mer Bretagne Atlantique for letting me present our technology and our business model today. At JEPS Techno, we imagine, design, deploy, and commercialize offshore innovative off-grid systems that aim to generate autonomous power, stabilize, collect, and communicate in situ data. Our strategy focuses on the simplicity, the reliability, the performance, and the bankability of our solutions. Our systems are simple to build, to install, to operate, and to maintain. We always adapt our offers to our customers' needs, and our ambition is to provide disruptive technologies to supply data, power, and communication anywhere on the oceans. We have seen human activities at sea increasing needing electricity. For various reasons, because it's simple, easy, and sometimes there's just no other alternative, diesel generators have been used offshore. Total installations represent 200 gigawatt with very heavy greenhouse gas emissions. Our ambition is to replace partially these diesel generators with our hybrid solar and wave autonomous platforms, integrating their own energy storage. Our platforms supply power to consumers at sea and in remote areas. The hybridization of renewable energies has been the key concept leading JEPS Techno's creation. According to their maritime experience, JEPS Techno's founders agreed on the fact that the combination reduces strongly the intermittence of the energy production, being complementary in time, seasonal and daily variations, as well as in space, and it limits the, sp the size of the storage. The technology used for the buoys and the platforms is the one used for vessels as well, to stabilize the ships and generate power. The anti-rolling tank is positioned on the beam of the vessel with water inside. When the vessel moves with the roll, the water inside the tank flows from one side to, it, to the other out of phase of the vessel moves. Thus, it stabilizes the ship up to 90% at peak period. As the water flows inside the tank, it goes through the turbines and generates electricity. This system has multiple benefits. It's an easy ship network in integration. It has a low maintenance need as, and is environmentally friendly as it reduces fuel consumption. This very innovative uh, fishing vessel has been ordered by the fishing family company Ljavjord in Norway and will be equipped this summer with 2 times 30 kilowatt G sire. The first vessel equipped was the research vessel Thalassa of the IFREMER, the French Institute of Research at Sea, with two times 15 kilowatt installed. We have received the prize for the Green Ship Technology of the Year back in 2018 during the GST and Shipping 2030 conference. And we're also members of Zestas to promote green ship technology in the maritime sector and towards IMO. So let's back, go back to our platforms and buoys. The wave energy converter uses the same concept as the stabilizer. Inside the hull, tubes in shape of a cross contain water in a closed circuit. Each time the waves make the hull move, the water naturally flows inside the tubes stabilizing the platform into the central water turbine linked to a generator. The 
purpose of the MidPower platform development on the top right is uh, 150 kilowatt installed was to demonstrate the scalability of the concept included in the commercially successful Wave Pearl on the bottom left with 1.2 kilowatt installed and then to add new applications and open to other market sectors with more power and more payload. The kickoff of the MidPower platform project was back in 2016. The prototype was then built in 2018 after a fundraising of 2 million euros with the participation of BPI France. Thanks to the Interreg program 4C, this prototype has now reached TRL7 and is being tested off the west coast of France since August 2019 on Centre Nantes Semrev test site. Its dimensions are 21 meters by 14 by 7 with a dead weight of 200 tons. The power installed is a 150 kilowatt solar panels and wave energy converter. We have 20% sun and 80% wave. So we have now this great technology moving forward and that will meet market expectations. As mentioned previously, total offshore diesel generator market represents 200 gigawatt installed. With an installed power between 50 kilowatt to 1 megawatt, our platforms supply electrical power to 10% of this market. JEPS Techno is a technology provider an architect for innovative solutions, and our success relies on our capacity to find the good partners to address the various markets where our solution is adapted. We're looking for industrial partners and energy providers to cooperate with us. Among the large number of applications that are targeted by our, for our platforms, we're focusing on small off-grid islands, less than 10,000 inhabitants, aquaculture, offshore wind and oil and gas. Our targeted customers are companies interested in reducing their envir environmental footprint without increasing their costs and public and private electrical energy operators. The company is profitable as we have commercialized engineering studies, stabilizers for ships and low power platforms. Our turnover based on 100% environmental positive impact technologies makes fundraising easier and generating profit help us finance our new developments. Our technology is sea proven. You can see here the various buoys of IFREMER, the uh, French Institute for Research at Sea, for scientific monitoring, those of Accrocean, our subsidiary company, for wind measurement, some R&D projects like the PH4S and WaveGem, and all our stabilization solutions for ships. We have sold and delivered more than 12 buoys and platforms that are being used today by our customers. Designed in a customer-focused approach, WavePro was created for wind assessment application. Its performance has been certified by the DMBGL according to Carbon Trust Stage 2, with results in line with the best figures of that type of device. Accrocean has deployed wave pearls in Europe and in Australia. Accrocean is not our only customer. We have carried out engineering studies and designed many stabilizers for various types of ships, mostly military. Thanks to a highly competent team, JEPS Techno is made up of 15 client-focused specialists engineers, PhDs, project managers, and business support teams, all working at the heart of exciting, sustainable marine projects. Each project is a new opportunity to increase the expertise of the team and also to in initiate innovations in hydrodynamics, CFD, seakeeping, energy conversion, and control command. JEPS Techno's ambition is to provide disruptive technologies to supply data power and communication anywhere on the oceans. The platform has a lifetime expected to be as long as a ship, so it's designed to remain on site for 30 years and will be constantly improved. The steel can be recycled, just like all the other components of the device. With increasing cells, it will be 660,000 tons of emissions avoided within 10 years. The ROI is estimated to three to four years for a wave gem unit. 
and at the same time, wave jam is also reducing particle emissions. It makes the consumer independent from oil price. The mooring is compatible with protected areas. It's simple to dismantle by removing anchors, and there's normal splits of fuel in the oceans. As it meets the UN Sustainable Development Goal 7 as an affordable and clean energy system, WaveGem was awarded of the Solar Impulse Foundation label in February 2020. Indeed, it contributes to the replacement of fossil fuel. To follow our activities, you can subscribe to our newsletters. It's every three months. Check our website and our pages on social networks and our YouTube channel as well. I hope you enjoyed this presentation of JEPS Techno and our activities. Thanks for your attention and I think I'll head it on to Michael again. Audrey, thank you very much. Really interesting company, great presentation. Uh, I also want to thank our partners. We have two French uh, cluster partners in, in uh, France, Polmia Bretagne Atlantique uh, and the Polmia Méditerranée. So thank you to them as well because they're helping us find really interesting uh, French companies. Um, um, we're going to go next to Orbital Marine, and I want to also say to Chris Bryslin, who I see is silently uh, sitting in the audience from Scottish Enterprise, uh, it was Chris that introduced us to Orbital. Um, you know, our, our relationships with our cluster partners in other countries is a real power for all of us, that we can help each other. And part of what we commit to is trying to help uh, companies that are members of our respective uh, clusters. So. This is, I think, a great example of, of picking up and seeing great companies that are working with wonderful clusters in other countries. So, Oliver, we look forward to hearing about uh, Orbital Marine. Over to you. That's great. Thanks so much for the introduction, uh, Michael. So, um, as Mark said, my name's Oliver Rank. I'm the Commercial Director at Orbital Marine Power. Um, some of you may have uh, met me previously in some previous roles that I've had working at the European Marine Energy Centre or previously with CIMEC Atlantis. I'm now with Orbital Marine Power. I had the uh, interesting journey of uh, transitioning over to a new job uh, during lockdown. Um, so it's been, uh, it's been an interesting journey, uh, but it's a pleasure to be here today um, from TMA Blue Tech to you know, invite me to present uh, Orbital's exciting uh, breakthrough tidal energy technology that, that we've been developing in the UK. Um, the team has spent in total over 17 years developing this revolutionary technology. And we're focused on unlocking the power of the tides. The, the energy density in the water is 800 times that of the air. Uh, and we're on a mission to provide sustainable, clean energy to millions of homes and businesses and people around the world. And uh, the picture that you can see here, someone uh, mentioned to me, I should, I should mention who that person is. Uh, it's not just a, um, you know, a, a model that we identified and asked to just look out wistfully into the distance. That's a picture of our CEO, uh, Andrew Scott there, actually based up in, uh, in Orkney, uh, looking out over one of the tidal stream flows that, that are in the Orkney Islands where we're demonstrating and improving our technology at the moment. This image that you can see here is a picture of the SR2000. This really was an industry breakthrough project for us. It was a demonstration R&D project, but it was still at two megawatts in size. Each of the turbine nacelles uh, was one megawatt, had 16 meter road to diameters. Uh, and in terms of mass, it's about 500 ton mass. Um, so. For the engineers amongst you, you, you may have done the math on that quickly to work out. That's approximately the same amount of steel that you would see in a two megawatt onshore wind turbine. So just from a, from a cost perspective, in terms of mass, we're, we're fairly similar in terms of wind. So we think that so that's a good starting point and puts us on, on a good trajectory there. What you can see here is the image of the, the prototype machine being lowered into the water. Um, it then floats on the surface of the water uh, and towed into location there. The construction philosophy that we have is really central uh, to what we think are, are unique advantages at Orbital Marine Power for harnessing the power of the tides. Uh, namely, we've got a very 
simplistic um, manufacturing process, which is analogous to shipbuilding. So you can see the machine here on the left hand side of the screen being towed by the small multi cat. And what we think is going to be really uh, important for us there is that this kind of shipbuilding technology exists you know, all over the world. So we can see the superstructures for these could be manufactured you know, anywhere in a country where there is a, a strong tidal stream or tidal power. Importantly as well, there's no dependency on um, high cost specialist construction vessels. So the multi-cat that you can see there was used for all offshore operations. So for the moorings, the anchors, cable connections and for the device installation itself. So from a perspective there, that means we, again, we're mo more likely to be able to use local operators uh, to invest those economic benefits in the local region. Um, but also it really helps us drive down the, the cost because they're simplified standard offshore operations um, that you, know, you could really see being uh, provided by many, many different offshore operators around the world. The other thing that's particularly unique about the orbital technology is our maintenance philosophy. So you can see here on the left hand side, um, there's a small uh, work boat there and the technicians, you can see how easy it is for them to stop, step on and off of the platform. For any of those of you on the call that have uh, either been onto a, an offshore wind platform or been to one, you'll notice that you have an interesting point where the, the turbine itself is fixed and the maintenance vessel is moving up and down. Um, which means with above certain wave heights, you can't access the offshore wind turbine. Here, the boat and the uh, turbine are actually next to each other. So they're moving at the same um, frequency. But also, if we have beam on waves, the, the machine itself actually acts as a breakwater, which improves our accessibility. And ultimately, that's all about improving uh, the uptime of the turbine uh, and you know, reducing that levelized cost of energy that we that we have in terms of the performance of the machine um, this really was record breaking uh, we achieved a peak output of 2.2 megawatts from a single tidal energy platform and over the course of an entire um, 365 days we produced seven percent of orkney's electricity demand uh, so it's really important to highlight here that this demonstrator whilst it was a, it was a demonstrator project it showed the commercial viability of the technology. We're powering homes and businesses that people were relying on. And so for context, Orkney has about 20,000 people in it. Um, we think that there's huge advantages from the predictability of the, the tides and the generation there. Uh, in terms of the survivability, we're able to survive storms of six plus meters in wave height, and we're able to still maintain the generation from the device in three plus meters waves. Each nacelle that was installed on the turbine um, generated over 6,000 hours, and we produced over 3.2 gigawatt hours from this machine. Uh, in total, there were 30 interventions, and we actually didn't have to remove the platform um, from its installed location at any point over that time period. Uh, and in fact, the quickest time we were able to fix the turbine uh, was 45 minutes from identifying that there was a fault to going out on the fact form, actually fixing it and having the turbine up and generating again. So you know, really quick kind of turnaround times there. Um, for those of you uh, who like a good graph, uh, which, which I do, uh, I'm that way inclined, um, I, I find this one particularly interesting. I hope you do too. This shows you a graph of the power production from the SR2000 over a 12 month period. Um, you can see you know, it's not it's not straight line. There's not continuous generation. It's variable generation uh, on the right hand side up from the 2.5 gigawatt hour generation point to the top. You can see we've had continuous generation over that period of time, no intervention, uh, no maintenance events. And you can see that kind of cyclical uh, generation kind of coming up and down. And that, and that represents the neap and spring tides that we would anticipate seeing in any uh, tidal site. If we come back down to the graph to the bottom left hand side, you can see some kind of plateaus that are in there. Um, this is the kind of commissioning phase that we would have had and where, you know, as a prototype, it's R&D, you're learning things. We're finding faults with the machine. We're going out and we're fixing them. But the important thing to note is 
every time that there's a, a flat line, that's only for a week or two, maybe at, at most. Um, if you had a bottom mounted tidal turbine, you know, you would need to find the correct weather window within the tides. It could take you a month to remove the machine, a month to do the work. You know, you have to find a specialist heavy lift vessel and then you put it back in. So that flat line could have gone on for months. Um, so really, this, I think, excellently demonstrates the advantage that we've got in being able to access the machine offshore. Um, point of reference as well for those uh, eagle eyed of you, you'll see around about December, there's quite a long period of time where, where the machine kind of flat lines in terms of its generation. Um, Interestingly, there wasn't actually any maintenance event at that point. Uh, we were so happy with the generation and the performance of the machine uh, that we actually turned the machine off over Christmas uh, and basically gave everyone the, the two weeks holiday uh, that had been well deserved from you know, developing such a fantastic test program. But as we said, the, the SR2000 was good. It was a demonstrator, uh, but we knew that we could do better. We've got to drive down the innovation uh, we've got to drive down the cost. So this is our next iteration of the machine. This is the O2. Uh, it's been improved from the SR2000. Uh, in total, it's 74 meters in length. Uh, it's got pitch controlled uh, hubs now, so which means that the blades can actually turn to maximize the amount of generation that we have from, um, from the machine. And we've increased the swept area to a 20 meter rotor diameter. Also, you'll notice that the leg structure has changed a bit those again eagle-eyed of you. When we retract the legs from the O2, what will happen is the, the nacelles will actually come up above the waterline, which means we can access the nacelles for things like you know, lubricant change out, some you know, planned maintenance events. We can still do those on site, which we think again is going to reduce our levelized cost of energy. And this machine is in full swing in fabrication at the moment. Initially, it was planned for deployment in November this year. Uh, obviously, as with all kind of large construction projects, uh, we've all been subjected to some rather extenuating circumstances uh, that I don't think anybody else is really planning on, on having to deal with in 2020. Um, so we are slightly delayed, but only by about three or four months. All of the major components are still progressing on, we're working through factory acceptance testing for various parts. I can just give you a quick taster of that. So you can see some of the main castings that have been you know, being pulled together here, the superstructure on the right hand side. You can see here the superstructure with the, the points where the leg uh, retraction system will connect to. This is the superstructure which has been painted. It's been transported up to Dundee, where we're completing all of the final assembly of the machine. Uh, this is one of the outside cases of the blades which are being uh, built and tested. So we do very uh, extensive strain testing on the blades to make sure they're, they're fit for purpose. The, at 20 meters, these will be the largest turbine blades um, that will have been installed anywhere uh, in, in the world. This is the electrical skid. So this is our uh, engineering team up in Orkney. So we actually you bolt all of these bits together, take the component parts and build the, the kind of the brains of the machine, as it were. Uh, and that's been shipped down again to Dundee and that's inside the superstructure kind of ready to go at, at the moment. So as well as the electrical guys, the offshore guys have been busy at the moment. What you can see here uh, is you can see one of our anchor baskets. So again, eagle eyed of you on the left hand side, you'll see a crane uh, and a um, and a pier. So we're not doing this offshore. What we're doing is we're testing this onshore. We're testing all of the, the uh, activities that we do, even though we've deployed four of these before, uh, we run the process to make sure we've worked all of the bugs out. So it's much easier to do that onshore uh, than it is to do it offshore. You know, you want to understand, okay, there's a problem here. How do we improve it? I'll speed up here. Only a few yeah. slides to go. Then uh, this is the last picture is the, the, the nacelles. So this is being built by SKF, who are one of the world's leading bearing manufacturers. This uh, means working with SKF that they can bring a lot of engineering experience uh, to improve the reliability and availability of the machine. Outside of looking at utility power scale, we're also looking at alternative markets. Hydrogen, we in fact produce some of the first green hydrogen uh, in the UK, uh, providing the electricity to the European Marine Energy Centre. We think coupling 
Tidal with battery storage is really important. Also, desalinization and run of river uh, is, is going to be really important. So, very much welcome everyone uh, to forward further interest or inquiries to this. We've got an ongoing R&D program beyond the O2 to drive this even um, further down to drive that cost of energy. Uh, and I happily take any questions afterwards. I do apologise, Michael, if I was a couple of minutes over there. <laughs> Well, it's a great presentation. It's always difficult to get people to uh, be brief when they're so passionate. So great presentation, very interesting company. Um, again, I want to just remind people, uh, don't wait until the end. Start putting your questions in chat, please. Um, without any further ado, I'd like to hand over to Yi Chao, who uh, is a great story as well. We're pleased that Yi Chao is one of our member companies. So each of us are have been recommended by a cluster and uh, each I'll over to you to present as the final presenter and then we'll bring Jason in to kind of uh, moderate the the uh, round table. Thank you very much. Um, let me know if you see my screen. We do. Yeah, thank you uh, TMA Blue Tech for this opportunity and thank you for everyone dialing in. My name's Yi Chao, founder and CEO of c -Trek. I'm going to switch gear a little bit from these two wonderful companies harvesting energy from ocean tidal current, ocean waves, to ocean thermal energy, as Jason mentioned earlier, to uh, power ocean observing. And then shifting from kind of the great scale, industry scale, gigawatts, megawatts, or even many kilowatts, to, uh, to tens of watts, or even a few watts, uh, to, uh, uh, to power ocean sensors, ocean drones, and you will be amazed what one can do with this a few watts of, of tens of watts of energy for ocean observing. So SeaTrack's mission is provide this ocean thermal energy to power underwater drones. Over the last decades, we have been seeing rapidly increase of underwater sensors, uh, platforms, autonomous systems to collect data. Um, we have been collecting more data uh, in the last 10 years and then over the last 100 years. And this trend is going to be continue to rise rapidly. Uh, according to the most recent report by the Department of Energy, the underwater drone market is going to increase to over $5 billion in a couple of years. So we're going to capture this uh, opportunity. Uh, um, we address the, one of the challenges uh, of this ocean observing problem, how to power them, particularly in the deep ocean, remote areas, logistically challenging. Some of these sensors and drones are low cost. They can be uh, expendable and disposed on the sea. And as you can imagine, what I've shown here on the left panel, we have been leaving a thousand of these dead batteries on the seafloor, and you can see have a, a fairly negative impact to the environment. Um, even limited power, you can only power a few sensors. And also on top of that, uh, there's safety uh, regulation, you know, shipping and then storage, and then how to uh, uh, manage this battery system uh, on ships. Um, for most uh, high cost, expensive drones, and this, platform have to be recovered and then changing battery either on the ship or bring it back to shore. And as you can imagine, that's a very expensive operation. And then logistically, particularly in a high latitude, it's really difficult to reach certain seasons. And certainly there's a constraint of the power. You're constantly fighting be between sensors, or what sensor you can carry and how long the platform will last. So this is the problem C-Track has been addressing over the last decades. Uh, we find a green energy solution using this thermal energy to power underwater sensors and drones. Uh, we harvest energies uh, from the natural occurring temperature difference in the ocean. As you all know, there's unlimited clean energy in the ocean. The ocean is warm in the surface, cold at the depths. So we harvest this energy through uh, phase change materials, either through uh, solid to liquid phase transition or liquid to gas depends on the energy production our customer is requiring. For low powered energy production, uh, we can use the solid material to, um, uh, to expand in volume as you heat it up uh, once you are exposed to warm water. And that thermal expansion will be used to spin the, the, the motor and generate electricity. 
similarly, um, the liquid to gas phase change and an output 10 or even 100 times more energy uh, been patented technology. We have been commercializing the last few years. So uh, we, um, we are the winner of the most recent DOE now uh, uh, price competition powering the blue economy uh, for ocean observing. So I'm going to show this brief video, also talk a little bit more about our technology, the product, the use case uh, for the early application. So hopefully you can hear the video. 100 miles off the coast of Hawaii, a float attached to Trek's energy module is powered by the very depths it is exploring, the ocean's temperature changes. Trex founder, Dr. Yi Chao, was inspired by oceanographer Henry Stommel, who envisioned a network of 1,000 floats powered by the sea. The ocean has quite a story to tell, and floats harnessing green energy from the deep blue allow us to surface the narrative. But today's floats are not without limitations. Nearly 1,000 floats perish each year and fall to the ocean floor along with their dead batteries. How can we sustain ocean observing without harming the ocean? SeaTrack brings Stommel's vision to life, creating energy that is for the ocean by the ocean. SeaTrack's energy harvesting system, commercially available today, extends the life of floats indefinitely, allowing for more sensors and rapid sampling. SeaTrack is ushering in a future where ocean observing is as green as the ocean is blue, a future with eco-friendly bots that are more powerful, last longer, and provide data to better predict hurricanes and protect the ocean and the lands it borders. A future where the heartbeat of our aquatic ancestor remains strong and resonant, and her story endures for generations. So I just give you a very specific use case, and this is where uh, our initial market is targeting for this one particular use case, and then deep, uh, the community, international community, uh, have one like to deploy a thousand of these uh, floats uh, power, uh, with uh, exp expensive sensors for biogeochemistry. Uh, typically, one of these battery-powered floats costs hundred thousand dollars. Expendable in the ocean, they can collect two hundred profiles, and then battery is dead, and then you're gonna uh, sunk to the ocean. Uh, so each one of the data I show you here is cost about five hundred dollars to provide a profiles of data. So as other any renewable energy, we we is cost a little bit more front. We um, our system. Uh, increase 50%, uh, increase to $150,000 per, per float with our energy system attached. And we can uh, essentially enable unlimited profiling. If you assume uh, even roughly 10 times more profiles, we can reduce the cost of the per profile data by at least a factor of five, if not more. Uh, we have been continued to uh, develop the next generation product and ongoing R&D. Uh, we are in the next Q4 of this year, we're going to release energy harvesting system attached to underwater gliders, so we can enable the glider to you know, have unlimited profiling capability. Um, uh, we are working with Defense uh, Department, DARPA, and, and their defense contractors to scale up the energy harvest system from few watts to tens of watts, so we can power more high-performance gliders. Uh, we are in the R&D prep stage to develop underwater power station, no surface expression, um, cost-effective way to provide power to charge um, underwater vehicles. And then even on the ice in the Arctic, we're harvesting air-sea temperature difference to provide kilowatt hours every day to, uh, to weather stations, drones, underwater profilers, underwater sensors. Um, we are... We have a competitive advantage being uh, the only um, renewable energy solution in the deep sea. There are a number of different companies re exploring surface um, renewable energy to power uh, autonomous systems, uh, ranging from solar energy, wave energy, and the wind, wind energy. Our vision is to um, provide this green unlimited energy to all these underwater sensors and the platforms currently powered by uh, uh, harmful batteries we don't want to be throwing into the ocean. Our ex team include expertise in ocean research technology, underwater robotic, uh, successful entrepreneurs exit their company uh, successfully 
government relations to help us to with the industry uh, grants and contracts. We have been uh, spending decades in the making to uh, mature the technology. We spent the first half of the journey at uh, Jet Propulsion Lab at NASA to, um, uh, to mature, develop the technology. Uh, we spent off to 2016 with exclusive license from Caltech to commercialize the technology, getting family foundation money in the beginning, government SBIR contract, and we successfully raised our um, uh, angel investor round last year, released our early product, uh, have early revenues, and we have industry partners, contracts, and backlog of orders to deliver this year. Our vision is to uh, to have this two-stage fundraising effort to grow our revenue in the next few years to capture this multi-billion dollar underwater drone market. Uh, and then we're planning to, uh, we are raising a Series C round currently and then and planning a Series A round next year to uh, support our growth. In the, in the, we are raising money during the COVID. Uh, we just opened our, our first price round, Series C. Uh, last week, uh, we have a term sheet signed by the lead investor, raised one half million dollars, uh, with um, sixty percent committed so far. And we like to raise another six hundred thousand in the next four months or so. We're use the fund to to accomplish our milestones to uh, enhance our government contract and industry grants um, effort and to continue to develop the next generation product and then glow our commercial sales and then build up the manufacturing capability. So thank you for your time and happy to answer your questions in the Q&A. Thank you, Yichao, three great companies. So uh, Jason, without any further ado, I'd like to hand it over to you. Hopefully people have been putting uh, questions into, into the uh, chat function and uh, you've got about 20, a little over 20 minutes. Yeah, thank you, Michael. And 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 clearly, uh, this was a great array of, of diverse approaches to deriving um, energy generation from the oceans. Um, I'll start by with a quick observation that it, I think it's been a truism of this sector that one of the problems we face is that unlike other sectors around, say, a combined cycle natural gas plant or a three-bladed upwind wind turbine. Uh, we're not quite sure what the, you know, air quote, best approach is to developing uh, uh, energy generation from the oceans. I think there's many different ways to do it, depending upon the market uh, and conditions. So uh, we'll see this play out over several years as you know, I he hesitate to use the word best technologies emerge. But obviously, one day, I think uh, for each of these individual sectors, we'll see um, see the, the winners emerge, but I think that's going to be a, a long process. And today you saw a great array of, of companies that are approaching uh, this sector from, from a variety of different angles. Uh, so I want to thank the presenters for providing those 10 minute presentations and get right into the questions. Uh, if you please note uh, under the chat section, there are there's an opportunity for you there to put uh, questions directly in. I see that uh, Oliver has already answered uh, a number of questions, so I encourage you all to take a look at that. Uh, and we have some pre-prepared questions that we wanted to start with. And as I see questions come in under the chat section, I will uh, 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 go over to that section and, and, and raise those questions. So let's start from the top there. Uh, what are the improvements you plan to bring to the Wave Gym uh, technology? This is for JEPS Techno. Audrey? Yeah, there are two improvements actually that we're planning to uh, to to add. Is uh, first is the improvement of the PTO efficiency. Uh, even if we are competitive today in terms of uh, kilowatt hour price, uh, the amount of energy in the water flow is much higher um, and than what we are able to produce for now. So we have a roadmap to increase this and uh, the, the PTO efficiency between three to four times more, more power available. And uh, all the ongoing tests on the prototype are, are giving us input data to determine the priority areas of this development. And the second one is the integration of new en energies. The amount of energy produced by the same platform could be increased by integrating new in energies, such as wind, tidal, or, or tech. 
Um, so we already experienced that on small plat platform like the PH4S um, with the wave solar wind and tidal. And uh, the pilot platform costs twice a wave solar platform, but it produces it produced 10 times more energy. So we're really looking forward to implementing wind turbines or tidal or or tech um, in uh, applications on our platforms to uh, to produce more. Thank you. Uh, and let's uh, spread this out. Switch, switching over to the first question for orbital marine. How how do orbital marine powers turbines produce power? You're on. Uh, you're on mute, Oliver. I, I almost got the entire day through without uh, someone calling me out that I was on mute on a uh, on a Zoom or a Teams meeting, but unfortunately not uh, pipped at the post. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the key way is obviously it's the um, rotational energy there from from the tide. So the, the thing that's great about this technology is the the tidal turbines, the, the technology that's within the nacelles, you know, we're drawing from you know, several decades of research and development that's been undertaken in wind power. You know, um, fundamentally, you know, uh, engineers know how to extract electricity from rotating equipment. You know, that's that that's where <laughs> that's what we do. You think about gas powered power stations that that's where they're extracting the electricity from. And so by placing our turbines at the top of the water column. So there, there's an effect with the tidal flow whereby you know, as you go up the water column, uh, the speed of the water increases. So we're actually placing the tidal turbines right at the, the top of the water column where you can get maximum energy generation from it. So it's just, if you imagine, it's just hung underneath the machine and then they're both rotating, uh, spinning uh, with the power of the tires that's moving back and forth. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, let's move on to a question for C-Trek. Uh, Yi Chao, there, there are a lot of funding opportunities for the grid scale ocean energy projects, but can you comment about the future potential for the micro grid scale for like powering an island, for example, or even portable systems such as power uh, to power autonomous systems? Yeah, we have been uh, in, uh, working with uh, sponsors uh, primarily in the ocean observing space. So there's a lot of a variety of different uh, programs to uh, fund ocean observing. Um, so that's uh, where we, we, we stay closer to our potential customers and then partner with them early, try to uh, understand their needs and requirements, and then bring that into uh, uh, the, the, the the sponsors who uh, who fund uh, the existing technology, so we can offer alternative and then essentially help them to not only do more uh, with un renewable energy system, but also re reduce their cost and then specifically the the operational maintenance cost is tremendous for uh, for the ocean observing community. So that's where we come in to bring our value proposition. Thank you. And, and let's uh, let's let's switch over. I know that there are uh, some questions that have been posted, so I've been keeping track of those. Let's start with this one. It's actually a comment. I think it's a good one, though. Uh, it pointed out that uh, the in a, the DOE RPE is running a program on tidal and riverine research. Uh, that's true. That is called the Sharks Program or, or project, which is a great name. It stands for Submarine uh, Hydrokinetic and Riverine Kilo Kilo Dash Megawatt Systems. Uh, sharks and uh, again an RPE program for 38 million dollars. Um, the second question: What what interactions with marine animals have been encountered by each of the companies? And if uh, maybe uh, if you each of you can just as quickly as possible push through that that answer, and and I can, and I can follow up since that's a topic that uh, I've been focused on is uh, uh, for many years. I can give you a really quick answer, uh, Jason. Zero. Yeah. Zero impact, and, and that's not. I mean, that's a flippant answer. You know, not being. But uh, genuinely, at EMIC, there's been the longest-standing um, monitoring program for tidal power uh, at the Fall of Warness, working very, very closely with Marine Scotland. Um, effectively, I don't know if you saw, there was a very recent report that was published as well, which basically showed you know tidal energy having you know, zero impact on on marine life. Audrey or Yi Chow? Yeah, for uh, wave gem and wave pearls, um, we have uh, 
recently found out that there's zero biofilling inside the tubes, inside the, the platforms. So we're really, really happy about this. Other than that, it's normal biofilling on the mooring and the anchoring systems and on the, well, underneath the platform, but it's just like any other ship or any other offshore platform. Right. Well, so we're using closed system. Our material is in a closed container uh, in our own housing. Of, uh, it's different from OTEC. There's no uh, water being pumped or being circulated. Uh, we basically provide energy to monitor marine life and then help the researchers to uh, guide the policies and decision making for conservation and uh, ocean protection. Great. Uh, and I, if I might take the liberty to um, highlight the fact that the, the question of the potential environmental effects of marine hydrokinetics has, uh, has a great community of folks that international effort to understand this. Uh, in fact, just last month, the second edition of the uh, document called the State of the Science of Environmental Effects of Marine uh, Hydrokinetics, uh, published by Pacific Northwest National Labs, PNNL, funded by the Department of Energy in conjunction with the NREL, National Renewable Energy Laboratory, uh, provides a great survey of the state of the science, state of the knowledge of environmental effects, and in, in general, with these one-off deployments, uh, it is virtually impossible to, to measure an effect. Um, uh, I think the larger question and the longer term question is the cumulative effects from a raise, uh, which certainly is a topic that we will be watching uh, over the next several years. Uh, moving on to this third question, uh, how does the sea trek power uh, the pump to draw up the deep water? How, how long is the feed pipe uh, and to what depth? So we have two uh, systems. Uh, for our portable system, there's no... Uh, uh, no piping involved. Our system attached to the to the sensors and platforms. As the platform moving up and down, they feel the temperature difference, and then we we take the thermal energy uh, into our system, convert to electricity. For our uh, power station concept, uh, we are piping our working fluid. is Again, it's a closed system. Uh, essentially, we're pumping the fluid up and down to experience the warm and cold temperature. And then that where vaporize and working fluid and then generate electricity. Thank you. Uh, there's a question here that asks, isn't there a maximum length to the cable? And presumably we're talking about the transmission cable to bring power to shore. Uh, Oliver, you want to handle that one? Yeah, I can give a give a brief answer to that one. And I suppose it's this is a bit different um, from tidal to wave energy. Uh, depending if you're looking at, uh, I suppose, kind of utility scale wave uh, wave power, but for tidal power, you know, predominantly, you know, the the uh, the higher resource tidal streams are within probably three to five kilometres from the coast. Um, so at that point, there's not really too much of a problem uh, in terms of running the the cable from uh, shore or out, out to there. Now, what we have looked at within orbital is obviously, you know, looking to reduce our levelized cost of energy. We can actually daisy chain um, some of the turbines together. So if you have three turbines in a row uh, or more, then you can have the first turbine exporting and that cable can then go up into the next one and then up into the next one and then into one export cable. Because we've got the space uh, to place the power electronics within the, the turbine superstructure itself. So it allows us to do that without having to build or develop specific um, <coughs> uh, offshore connected or subsea connection pods for, for multiple cables. So that helps us out a lot. Um, I mean, technically you could go you could go much further offshore and we've seen you know, some of the offshore wind farms in the UK, you know, go tens or even I think some of them planned like 100 kilometers offshore you know, with really large substations, at that point, you are getting to uh, need to step up from AC to DC power conversion uh, to then export the power onto shore, and then you have to reconvert it back uh, to AC to, to sync in with the grid. Um, at the moment, we don't think that that's something we're going to have to do, uh, but you know, the technology exists there. Uh, it's been proven within offshore wind, so it's not really a, a huge issue that, that we can see. And we, you know, it's one of the, the great things we can benefit from a lot of the learnings that, that have happened in offshore wind. Uh, thank you, Oliver. And I think, I think it's, 
just making sure I wasn't muted there. Uh, and I think it's uh, a key point to, uh, to, to, to highlight the experience of the offshore wind sector, which over the last 15 years has installed, uh, I lost track now, I think we're at around 25 gigawatts of, of wind installed uh, in Europe alone with, with literally thousands of miles of subsea cables and inter-array cabling. Uh, that technology will continue to evolve. I think that marine hydrokinetics will uh, uh, continue to push the, the limits of the cable technologies. And I think we'll see over the next several years a continued effort to improve those cables for the flexibility, which is a, a key issue there. Um, I have some uh, some other questions here. What what about marine growth to the system? Do you need to recover the system to clean? Does it impair the system's productivity? And I'll leave that open for whomever would like to start. I, I can answer, but I'm leaving it to some other esteemed panelists because I feel like I'm talking a bit too much here. Yeah, I'm happy to uh, talk about uh, biofouling in the ocean observing community. Uh, we did a community surveys and then there's the top two challenges ocean observing is energy and the biofouling. So hopefully we address the energy problem and then now is opportunity to uh, to help develop new technologies to for anti-fouling device. And they also power limited. We hope to partner with the sensor provider developing a long lasting sensors so we can uh, uh, increase the data at the reduced cost. Audrey, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, we have our small buoys that have been at sea for the past eight years now. And for monitoring, scientific monitoring, and uh, it's just like any other buoy for navigation. So it's uh, it's very simple uh, maintenance on it. And there's no, not much... Uh, maintenance to do on it and uh, well the wave energy converter inside the platform inside the, the buoys is not affected by the biofouling because uh, the water is always moving inside and it's a closed circuit completely closed there's no light coming in so it really stops the biofouling inside the only place where there is some is on the anchors and the advantage of uh, being able to anchor these uh, these buoys and platforms uh, is that it's a very simple system. You can just anchor it anywhere in the oceans and uh, dismantle really easily as well. Thank you. So we have about uh, seven more minutes left. Uh, I'm going to keep asking these questions until uh, till Michael says stop. Um, I think we've answered all the, the posted questions. So let's go back to our original list. Uh, what are the difficulties that, this is for JEPS Techno, what are the t uh, difficulties that renewable energy developers are facing to supply green energy to far offshore locations or remote areas? Now, the first difficulty is the low reliability of the power takeoff and or the mooring. Uh, marine condition in these remote areas are very harsh, so it's difficult to have a to have good reliability. Uh, of course, our systems are quite good because they're stable already, well stabilized. Uh, second difficulty is to install and survive due to the lack of means in these areas. And our system being uh, from a passive technology doesn't really need much maintenance. We, we, um, our objective is to go on board only once a year and, and we're working on various projects today in which uh, we're just planning a visit once every five years. So, well, it's maybe a little ambitious, but uh, we hope to, to, reach, uh, to reach this target. And uh, well, the, the other um, difficulty is the cost. The high cost of the kilowatt hour um, of grid market is generally between 450 to 750 per megawatt hour. So it's very high. It's the price of diesel uh, offshore. offshore. And right now we're just about uh, just about reaching it. So uh, we're quite happy. And we, uh, we target to divide that price by two before 2030 uh, through manufacturing improvements and also technical developments on the PTO efficiency. Thank you. Um, 
Let's move to uh, Orbital. Um, what are the advantages of tidal power? I think, you know, presumably, I mean, ver versus or relative to the other marine hydrokinetic wave currents. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, the fundamental piece here, uh, Jason, you know, always people start coming back to is it's just the it's the reliability and the predictability of, of tidal energy. Um, I mean, and, I mean that that's that's the kind of standard answer that you would expect in in the sort of uh, uh, form. I mean, what, one of the other things that so we've been doing some additional work looking specifically at what the market benefit of tidal power is, um, and this is you know if, if we look globally uh, at what's happening here, there's this transition uh, within you know global energy systems to have a really high penetration of of wind energy. Um, and so what this means in terms of the, the price of power, because at the end of the day, you know, um, power consumers, homes, businesses and utilities. Um, yes, it's nice having these these interesting technologies, but at the end of the day, it's about the price of power and being able to turn your light. And that, that's really what people care about. You know, making it low carbon is, is becoming almost a given now, which is great. Um, but what we're kind of seeing with this in, in terms of the advantages of tidal power is that when you get a really high penetration of, of wind energy onto a system, effectively that system then gets flooded with electricity, um, which means the price of power drops dramatically. And in fact, you find many wind turbines, even in the UK now, uh, are told to stop generating. Um, so, so you, your cost um, is actually going up for the for the installed capacity. This also then happens the other way, where when the wind isn't blowing, the price of power goes really, really high um, because you know the the grid operator needs to buy buy into power wherever it can find it from. And so this is one of the great benefits that we've got because when the wind's not blowing, you know the tide's still flowing, and this means that tidal power can actually access. Um, these markets and these points where you know those you know seven or eight days you know in the UK when it's not windy the tide's still going and the market upside for that is is fantastic so the predictability but then also that flows through uh, into this you know very definitive market benefit and we're doing some some more detailed work looking at this and we hope to be able to publish some of that shortly. So, Great. We have one question left. If uh, if if Michael will uh, let us uh, attack, uh, address this question from the audience, Michael, do we have a, a moment to do that? We really don't. I'm sorry. Okay. We, right. we, we run a tight ship here, to say to use a, a nautical analogy. Uh, I wanted to say that these are amazing presentations. This has all been recorded. I do want to call out. We've had some incredible people that have been listening. Uh, I want to say hello to Mark O'Reilly who is the CEO of Team Humber Marine Alliance in Hull, UK. And if you don't know Mark, you should, because they really are a cluster that's focused on offshore marine energy. They've done a great job. Um, so Mark, uh, welcome and uh, be great to catch up sometime soon. Uh, this was really an amazing, um, amazing uh, group of companies. Um, I hope you would agree with that. Uh, obviously, it depends on whether your interests of those who are listening are very specifically uh, offshore energy, but uh, we will have a series of additional great uh, companies presenting. August is big data, September water, wastewater, October aquaculture, biomarine, and then in the future, there'll be a series of other um, really interesting events. Uh, we hope you will come back and join us. We want to thank our partners, the Blue Tech Cluster Alliance. Uh, uh, we really could not do this without the cooperation and support from our cluster partners in other countries. And that's something that we are looking to grow as well. And then locally, we work with the University of San Diego, the Brink, which is the rated the number one kind of accelerator in San Diego. So if you are interested in supporting our, our, our um, um, uh, Blue Tech Global Connect, please get in touch with us. We'd love to find a sponsor that would like to get the uh, uh, some of that uh, uh, good uh, uh, karma and 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 uh, uh, that we can thank on on air. I want a special thanks to uh, Jason and to Poet. Uh, you guys have really been a great partner. I know we've been working for several years. Uh, we had somebody from um, on our partner the the. Uh, Paul Bretagne Atlantique was reaching out to us and 
and looking to bring a delegation to uh, to California, and we immediately push it over to uh, to Jason, and I think he's going to give him some good advice, and and uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, welcome a delegation of French uh, companies that are coming, and we'll help put together a common uh, way to make those companies feel welcome and find some partner opportunities in the United States. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, this is our team. Uh, please feel free to reach out to us if we can help in any way. Um, you can see that, that Tamara Khan got hers pushed out to the right, so start with her. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. Please come back and please put uh, Blue Tech Week on your calendars and, and let us know what we can do to help you and, and your organizations to grow. Again, to our three companies, great, great job. We look forward to working with you in the future. Thanks very much.